Four years ago, I fled to paradise to visit my dad and my baby sister, who just now turned 30 this year. And yes, I still call her my baby sister. I think a part of me always will. I was eight when she was born. And I knew in caring for her that I wanted to be a mother from a very early age. We talked, we snuggled. And in that moment, I was perfectly content. But when the night was still and quiet, the only company I had was the solitary glow of a Google search engine where I found myself typing in five singular words, how to tie a noose. Now, I think we can all deduce that a Boy Scout tutorial with literal instructions on how to tie a slip knot did not immediately pop up, but rather it was a warning. And it was a dire warning that I immediately ignored. I have made some progress since that time in my life. Last year when I was preparing for my college communications final uh, that I needed for nursing via a Zoom screen, I remember um, it was the hottest day of the summer, pacing back and forth, uh, desperately thinking to myself, who the hell would ever, and I mean ever, want a career in public speaking? <laughs> but standing here in this moment, I want to tell you about the singular experience of my life that ultimately transformed me from a healthcare worker who works on the front lines of this global epidemic and into the fierce and passionate mental health care advocate that I am today. My story is ultimately what has given me the strength, the conviction, and the much needed courage to be able to stand before you today. Several years ago, after having just finished my schooling, I walked into the first day of my clinical trials my instructor, Mickey Sue, a fierce, passionate, and pint-sized woman with a big heart for others, led us to an isolated unit in the corner of the facility behind a passcode and locked doors. Her voice, normally strong, witty, and stoic, immediately began to soften. And it was then that I heard her speak the words that I have never forgotten. These are my people. They were the people that she had liked to take care of the most, her people in the dementia unit. In having cared for them over the last several years, the most frequent questions that they ask me, often with tears of confusion in their eyes, have been, where am I now? When can I go home? But mostly they ask me, where is my family? Last year, the trajectory of my life changed in an instant. When I saw a man who bore the scars of his illness, of his disease and addiction, in the ACU, the local hospital where I worked. My very best friend, let me borrow this image of her leg to illustrate what is very similar in appearance to the scars that this man bore. He had just been openly shamed at the nurse's station that morning during shift report, and I'm ashamed to admit that I had casually taken a part of it. Yet I have been an addict my entire life for as long as I can remember when I knew that I was addicted to the approval of others. Consequently, that is the one addiction I have yet to free myself of. And it is that vulnerability that led me to over 15 years of addiction with eating disorders and prescription medicine abuse. Shortly after I met the man I was inspired by the words of none other than Nora Valco, the director of the Institute of Drug Abuse, who raised a profound call to action last year when she said, if we are going to talk about the current addiction and overdose crisis, we need to treat combating stigma as no less important than developing and implementing new prevention and treatment tools. We need a large-scale social intervention to change public attitudes towards people who have a disease. It requires facilitating contact between a stigmatized group, that's me, and the wider community as a whole, which is you for right now. If people with substance abuse disorders, she said, can share their stories openly, then perhaps empathy and compassion can begin to replace judgment and fear. And that is ultimately what I want to accomplish today. Because five months before I ever typed in those ominous words in paradise, I found myself in a stuffy law firm on a hot summer day, sitting across from two petitioners, 
and my former spouse's parents. This was during a period of relapse for me after I had just suffered a devastating miscarriage and frustrated hands were thrown up and they had come to a drastic decision. But more importantly, and what I want to emphasize to you today was that it was a premeditated and a deliberate one. And that was to use abandonment as a method of reform for me. I specifically remember being told that day that I was not allowed to disparage the name of the petitioners, especially in front of my children, who were to be taken away from me for a time and into their custody while I sought mandatory treatment. And when I refer to this time period of my life, I often tell people that the dire repercussions of that fateful decision inevitably caused me more pain, more inner conflict, and more pervasive confusion than my disorder of addiction itself. And far from being callous or by displaying hearty doses of negative sentiment override towards my own family on a TEDx stage, my mission is to prove a vital point that lies at the heart of my message and that people are good. I knew my family were good and moral people. And that was why I was so confused that they thought that this method of reform would ultimately help me heal, to leave me alone. Despite having asked them in the days and the weeks, months and inevitably years that followed right up until this day, I can say that I've never received an answer that ever made complete sense to me, which is why I consider myself to not be entirely whole and why I am still so incredibly vulnerable around many of my family members to this day. And ultimately, I came to the conclusion that if this was happening to me in my own family, then it had to be happening to people like me everywhere in good families, just like mine. I also knew instinctively that nobody deserved to be treated in the way that I had been made to. The truth was, I felt myself dying a little bit each day in the months before I fled to paradise. Because what disparage means is to treat, regard, or represent someone as being of little or no worth. And for the vast majority of us who suffer from the very real physiological brain disorder of addiction, our illness does not align with our character or our morals. Morals that I continue to share and hold dear with my family. Earlier this year, I remember that a family member had once told me that it was not too late for me to come out of my proverbial cocoon and to see the world as it truly is. After I had attempted to seek closure through accountability of their own accord. My response to her was, I do see the world as it really is. I still carry around my guilt and I still carry around my shame because you just gave me the conflicting illusion that you cared about me by saying to me that I deserved better. And then you proceeded to shame me and reinforce guilt. And after you did that, you said you believed in me. You said that you would always wish me the best and that you would be here to cheer me on. When you reinforce shame, I told her, you drive people further away. You bury them further into their proverbial cocoon. I wanted healing and closure because of the theme of accountability. I am someone who has triumphed in the 12 steps of recovery. They are traditionally known and utilized for people like me as a last resort when they already feel defensive, angry, and vulnerable. I know because that was the place that I started from. And I thought more about the 12 steps of recovery, 12 steps that have been around for years, 12 steps that people like me succeed in every day, every month and every week with a newly updated, as of this year, 50 to 75% success rate when consistently maintained. And Nora Valco said that we needed innovative treatment tools that were preventative in nature. 
We can do this by implementing immersive accountability within our families right at the pivotal moment when you feel like abandoning us. And that is the danger zone. And that is where you have your power. Because the family is the fundamental unit of society. And addiction is a family disorder. And I want to validate the feelings of those of you who have an addict in your life because I know that it is exhausting and difficult to love us. But if you can hold yourselves accountable to the first and foremost singular principle in step one, that we truly are incapable, that our lives have become unmanageable, and that we can't heal ourselves on our own, I invite you to think about how many more lives that we could save. And for the people who suffer and who continue to suffer in my capacity, I know what it feels like to not have your voice be heard. I know that my voice felt smothered. Nora Valco also called for a social intervention radical change that can be implemented in small ways. The truth is, it's hard to talk to your family and your friends when you feel vulnerable. So use social media. Give your parents a text, but first encourage them to read the 12 steps. And I want you to read the 12 steps as well, each and every one of them. And I'm going to give you some examples. Step two, dad. Recognize that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. But first, you have to realize that I feel insane inside. My reality is dictated by a destructive and a compulsive internal narrative that punishes me way more than you can. So when you feel like punishing me, when I push you away in defensiveness to seek solitude in my instinctual shame, you will know and you will come to understand that in that moment... You have the chance to be my greater power by giving me permission to not punish myself. And then you can reflect on the things that you can say and do that can draw me near. Step eight, friend, make amends with me. Forgive me completely and entirely so I can live my life free of stigma and feel fully integrated back into society. Step 10, Jenny. Daily accountability. That's right. I want to show you what real accountability looks like in real time. I want to tell you that I've messed up recently. But it's probably not in the way that you would imagine an addict to mess up. Because the last time that I succumbed to my own internal narrative was 13 days ago. Five weeks ago, I had given a talk in front of my own family and I found myself feeling just as vulnerable and partly insecure. And that outward demeanor that I had was erroneously interpreted, I found out later, as suspicions of drug use. But because of my cognitive deficits, my impulsivity and my lack of judgment that I have from time to time, I ended up insulting several members of my family in that talk, unbeknownst to me. But what I did feel and what is really hard to describe is the immediate sensation of feeling completely alone and isolated in a room full of my family. When I saw eyes diverted and backs turned and when no one came up to me or no one spoke to me, it was so incredibly isolating and shaming. And it was that shame that led me when I got home to compulsively abuse an over-the-counter sleep aid that logically I knew better. And we all do. So many of us know better. And I fought the temptation to not punish myself in the days that would follow. And it was a struggle. And if I'm going to be 100% accountable, it has taken me each and every one of those days from that one to this to fully shed the ideation, the loneliness, and the pervasive shame that I felt as a result. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy that happens to people like me everywhere, every day, all over the world, who feel pushed into their illness. 
into their proverbial cocoon through the reinforcement of shame. And I have no doubt when it came to my family that it was unintentional. So I will hold myself to step 10 in daily accountability to watch my triggers and to think of ways that I can be better and do better. And if I can do this in front of you today with no shame, if the thousands of people who suffer in my capacity can do this with physiologically damaged minds, which people need to remember are always the repercussion of psychologically damaged hearts and souls that have been traumatized or maimed in one way or the other. I have no doubt that you can take back your power here and in this moment to begin to actively avoid your own what if questions through what I now call the 12 steps of prevention. Because I want to show you what it was that I saw that day when I walked the doors of an addict's room. That definitive moment in time when I knew that I was going to be an advocate. I saw myself. You see, when I walked the doors of an addict's room and saw a man that I had just shamed and who had heard being shamed that looked like me and whose outward scars reflected my own, I had already obtained the sound knowledge that I loved myself. I already knew that I was worthy. And because I knew that I was worthy in that moment, I immediately required no other form of knowledge than to know instinctively that everyone who thinks as I do, who feels as I do, and who looks as I do, is worthy. And I want to tell you what it was that I told my teenage son when I asked him to take this picture of me. As you can see, my uh, hair is just starting to grow back in that picture uh, after I had impulsively cut it all off the day before my 37th birthday, um, which was again indicative of my disorder. In real life, (laughs) my hair does not grow that fast. Trust me, (laughs) I wish that it did. But this is me, scarred, shorn, and fully accountable. And I told my son when I struck that stance to make sure to get my good side, finally understanding that all of me was good because I made a premeditated and a deliberate choice in that moment. And that was that I was not going to reinforce a cycle of shame onto myself or onto my children because I loved myself. And because if you recall, I am my own best friend. And if you take away one singular truth from our time together today, I hope it is this. Kindness is life sustaining. Be kind to others, but be especially kind to yourself. Forgive yourself when you mess up and have the courage to be your own best friend so that you can be there for someone else. Because the 12th and final step was our own grand call to action. We had our own awakening and we tried to carry this message to the rest of the world and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Just as my instructor, Mickey Sue, led me. On my very first day as a healthcare worker to a world behind a passcode and locked doors to her people, in the isolated units of society who continue to ask themselves with tears in their eyes. Just like the man who looked like me asked me on that day behind those doors, where am I now? When can I go home? And then he looked up at me and when he asked me, where, when can I see my daughter? The full meaning of her words now come full circle for me in this moment because you are my people. You are now the people that I like to help the most. So ask yourselves, are you worthy? Do you think that I am? 
because the story of my life has manifested to me that the answer is not an illusion. Thank you.